Johnny here. Right now, I'm at the magnificent UNESCO World Heritage 5th Century Citadel of Sigiriya. And in this short film, I'm going to talk about tourism in Sri Lanka. For a relatively small island, Sri Lanka packs a big punch. With three distinct climatic zones, from the coastal region, through the rainforests and jungles of the interior, to the impressive central highlands, the country's varied and spectacular landscapes are matched by the island's fascinating history and cultural diversity. From the highland tea plantations to cave temples, from golden Buddhas to abundant wildlife and endless beaches, the country has a plethora of sights and experiences with which to attract the visitor. The nation's capital, where most trips to the country will start, is Colombo, a sprawling city mixing modern skyscrapers with an old colonial heritage. One of the best ways to explore the city is on a walking tour, where you can learn about the country's past, sample the street food, or get stuck into some of the country's more serious culinary adventures. From here, heading north, the next place you'll come to is Dambulla, home of the first century BC cave temple packed with golden Buddhas and the amazing UNESCO World Heritage Site of Sigiriya. Developed first for the kings of the 5th century as a fortress and pleasure dome, as evidenced by the raunchy frescoes on the walls of some of the caves, it was later used as a monastery and place of meditation for the country's Buddhist monks. Climbing to the top does require a degree of effort, particularly if you happen to be doing it in early summer, but the views from the top, overlooking the surrounding countryside, are simply breathtaking. From here, now travelling south in a clockwise direction, the route takes you past the former 12th century capital of Polonarua, home to a number of impressive sites, including one of South Asia's biggest stupas, before continuing north to Kandy, the stepping off point for the central highlands. Set amongst the surrounding hills, Kandy has many attractions, including the famous Temple of the Tooth, said to house the Tooth of the Buddha, and an incredible botanical garden, where you can witness everything from towering palm avenues to delicate tiny orchids. So no trip to Sri Lanka is complete without a train journey. Now the British built the railways in the 19th and early part of the 20th century, and today the railway network forms a major part of communications of Sri Lanka. But if you're a tourist like me, uh, you are most likely to take the route between Kandy and the hill stations around Hatton. Now most people prefer to sit in the carriages in first and second class where you get air conditioning and a nice comfort seat. I prefer to sit at the open door and enjoy the views. Similarly, it was the British that brought tea to Sri Lanka in the early part of the 19th century, and now tea production is a major part of the island's economy, with hundreds of square kilometres under tea plantations. Here you can see all aspects of the industry, from watching how the women pick the leaves, to visiting a tea factory to learn how those leaves are dried, rolled, graded, and turned into the tea that we drink. For those interested in wildlife, heading southeast, we come to Yala National Park. Split into five separate zones and covering a total area of over 1,200 square kilometers, here you can witness all manner of exotic birds and animals, from wild elephants and wild boars to axis deer and storks. But the National Park's star attraction is undoubtedly the leopard. With Zone 1 of the park, home to 104 leopards, meaning one leopard for every 2.7 square kilometers, Yala National Park has among the highest density of this beautiful animal anywhere on Earth. Now heading west and coming almost full circle, we arrive at the old colonial fortress town of Gaul. The Portuguese, the Dutch and the British, all of whom ruled the town and the island at one time or another, have all left their mark on this fascinating and easy to navigate walled peninsula. To walk through the old town, enjoying the narrow alleyways of the Arab Quarter, the fine colonial architecture, or along the fortified city ramparts, particularly at sunset, offers today a tantalizing glimpse into the island's varied past. And of course, being an island, Sri Lanka has beaches. Miles and miles and miles of them. Of course, there are many other places in Sri Lanka that one can visit. Adams Peak in the centre of the southern half of the island, the former ancient capital of Anuradhapura, some of the pristine beaches of the east coast, or Jaffna in the north are all worth visiting. The food of the island is delicious and for me was a real highlight, particularly that delicious crab. 
and the accommodation is among the best I've ever seen anywhere, with my two favourite hotels being the Water Garden near Sigaria, with its fabulous pool and great views of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, and the Last House on Cinemadara Beach, so named as it was the last house that the famous Sri Lankan architect, Geoffrey Bauer, designed. So I have just loved my journey around Sri Lanka. I think it's the combination of so many factors. The fascinating history, the great culture, the wonderful landscapes and beaches, the delicious cuisine, and some of the most friendly and hospitable people I have ever met anywhere have combined to give me such a great trip. And I think if you add in a really good infrastructure and some of the best hotels I have ever been privileged enough to stay in, then I think this beautiful island in the Indian Ocean really has something for everyone. <laughs>